we're going to continue with our replay teaching on divine healing, and this will be our fourth one. And we may finish today or we may finish next Friday, but we're getting pretty close. So what we've been talking about is there's five key enablers for divine healing. And we've already talked about the first three, which is Satan is responsible for sickness and death. You know, God is not responsible for these. God is the answer to sickness and God is the answer to death. You know, specifically Jesus paid to save us from um, both of those. Secondly, we have to come to realize that God's goodwill is that he wants us to be healthy in our body and healthy in our soul. He wants us to be healed and whole. And remember, the Bible says that we can pray for anything according to God's goodwill, and the answer is yes. And that just requires us to believe and to handle the situation and pray for the situation in the correct manner, which we'll talk about uh, maybe today, probably today. And the third thing we looked at this last time is we saw that Jesus paid for the healing of all people the same as he paid for you know all sins of all people. You know, everything Jesus did, all the sufferings that he did, it was for the benefit of all mankind, for anyone who can believe. And so it's not that he picks and chooses who's going to be healed and who's not going to be healed. Everyone's healing is paid for the same as everyone's salvation is paid for. And it requires faith on the part of the sick person or faith on the part of someone else to deliver the goods that Jesus paid for. And so I want to just flash back for a second. And to me, the absolute most important scripture for healing is Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Because this one clearly just lays out exactly what Jesus did. You know, he bore our sicknesses so we don't have to bear sickness. He carried our pains so that we don't have to have pain. And then when we looked at the definitions of these words, it covers everything that could be wrong with your body and everything that could be wrong with your soul. You know, so it's uh, it's very wide reaching. It's not like a it's not like a narrow salvation from sickness. It's big and broad, right? It's not just the flu, but it's anything that could be wrong with your body and anything that could be wrong with your soul. And that becomes very evident when you look up the definitions. And then it goes on to say, and we are healed by his stripes. So this to me, this is the most important scripture in my in my mind. And then you have other supporting ones like Matthew 8, 16 to 17, 1 Peter 2, 24. So those three passages all go together. They all testify to the same thing that was spoken back in Isaiah about Jesus bearing sicknesses, carrying pains, and taking stripes on his back to pay for the healing of all people. Okay, and then we we had a, another angle on this that we talked about, which is redemption from curse. So anybody who's accepted Jesus, we have been redeemed out from under the authority of the devil. We have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. We have been redeemed from law and curse. And so now we're under grace and we are redeemed from curse. And curse has no right to come upon us. And we have to know the salvation that belongs to us so that if the devil tries to put some curse upon us, we resist it and make him flee. And then we saw this huge list of terrible things. Um, you know, the ones in red are many of the health related curses that you can find back in the Old Testament. We're redeemed from all of this stuff. And there's even a curse called in every sickness and disease not mentioned in the book of the law shall be a curse, <laughs> right? So there's there's nothing, let me say it differently, everything that could be wrong with your body is a curse, amen? And we are redeemed from curse, so these things have no right or authority to come upon us. So, so once we come to realize what belongs to us in our salvation, then we can more effectively resist the devil and make him flee and walk in victory in our health, which is definitely what we all want to do. Okay, so today we're going to talk about God has given us authority, the Holy Spirit, and power so that we can heal the sick and so that we can walk in health and defend ourselves against the works of the devil. Okay, so I want to start by saying it's really interesting when you read the Gospels, you know, the disciples, they were very effective in ministering to the sick. In fact, there's only one story that was presented in which they were unsuccessful. Now, they may have had more unsuccessful attempts than the one, but the only time, the only one that's mentioned is when there was an epileptic boy and the father of the boy told Jesus, you know, I took him to your disciples, but they were not able to heal him. And Jesus reprimanded them for being faithless and perverse. You know, so the reason they couldn't get the boy healed is because 
um, well, they had a, a mom, they had a lapse in their faith, and they they just couldn't, you know, they couldn't get the boy healed. And I'm pretty confident that what happened is the boy had a seizure in front of them, just as the boy had a seizure right in front of Jesus. And when somebody's flopping around on the ground like a fish having a seizure, it's pretty hard to be in faith when you're looking at something that's very traumatic like that. So I'm pretty sure that's what happened to them. Just what their eyes saw made them doubt. Okay, but when you look at what Jesus did with his disciples, you know, these are unborn again people. So they do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They are not in the kingdom of God because they're not born again. So they, they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They haven't received um, anything yet. And so the only thing that they had is Jesus delegated to them authority. And in one passage, you can find where it says he gave them power. But in, in like the vast majority of the passages, all it says is he gave them authority to heal the sick. And so authority is the principal thing. You know, even unborn again people can operate in authority, you know, and, and heal the sick. And the disciples are examples of that. And so we're even equipped far better than the disciples. They weren't born again. We're born again. They didn't have a permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit, whereas we do. Um, you know, they had delegated authority, whereas we have inherited authority because we're literally sons of God. And these, these guys were not in the time of Jesus's ministry, right? So let's just take a look at that. So number one, Jesus didn't give his disciples a sermon on healing doctrine in order for them to be successful in healing the sick. All he did was tell them that he had given them authority to heal. You know, so this is really interesting because, you know, we're like having to go through all this teaching on healing. We have to go through all these sacred cow teachings to try and get set free from wrong understandings in the Bible. And so it seems to be a lot of work to get people to believe in healing in our day and age. However, back in Jesus's day, all he did was say, hey, I give you authority. Now go preach the gospel and heal the sick. And that was that was it. He didn't teach them healing. He just said, I give you authority. And that was, that was sufficient for them to operate in faith and be extremely successful without even being born again, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without any of those things that we have. Amen? And so if we can get, get back to that simplicity in our thinking, then healing and other things that we need to do for the kingdom of God should become easier and easier. It's just simple. You know, Jesus didn't give elaborate teachings other than you know, walking in love, right? So his biggest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, it was mostly about walking in love and is coming at that from various different angles. But as far as like teaching about healing and things like that, he never did it. It wasn't necessary. It was just a simple concept. I give you authority. Okay. And so Jesus, he sent the disciples out and he commanded them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so then the disciples went out preaching and healing and they were successful at it without ever studying healing doctrine. Okay, and then, you know, you can look up definitions of word, but when you're preaching the kingdom, you know, Jesus said to say the kingdom of God has come near to you. Like it hadn't quite come yet because he hadn't been resurrected yet. So the kingdom wasn't just yet available, but it, it was very near at that time. And the kingdom is available now. And anybody who's born again, the kingdom of God is within us. And the word kingdom... It's not talking about like a physical kingdom, but it's talking about, um, it's more like an authority, like the kingdom of God is about the rule and reign of God, you know, the dominion authority of God. So when you're born again, unlike the, the disciples, when you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit living in you and literally God rules and reigns through us to accomplish his will. So the disciples were just told, I give you authority, now go preach and go heal. And then they were successful except for the one example with the boy. So what we want to do is we want to keep it simple. You know, just like Jesus was kept it simple with his disciples, it should be the same for us. You know, Jesus gives all believers authority to heal. And we all, all we need to do is believe it and put it into practice. Amen. So it should be extremely simple for us. And so with these teachings, we're trying to get rid of any barriers and just kind of fine tune our faith. So let's look at a few examples of Jesus equipping the disciples. So in Matthew chapter 10, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness 
and all kinds of disease. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Okay, so notice um, this word power, first of all, it's the Greek word exousia. Exousia means authority. Okay, so sometimes authority is called power. There's different kinds of power. Like there's dunamis power and there's exousia. Exousia is like, is like authority. You have authority over a devil, therefore you command it and it will obey your command. Whereas um, dunamis is miraculous power of God itself, which is resident with the Holy Spirit. And so he's giving them authority. I give you authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of sickness, every kind of disease. And then he commissioned them, go and preach, tell them the kingdom of heaven, it's at hand, it's almost here. And then do all these works of power, healing, cleansing, raising, casting. Okay, so these guys, you know, they're releasing the power of God by way of the authority that Jesus delegated to them. Amen? And so he, Jesus always gives his disciples authority so that they can carry out the commission that he gives them. And it's no different in their day as it is in our day. And, and we'll see in a minute, we have the same commission to heal the sick and do all the things that the disciples were doing. That commission is everlasting until you know this world comes to an end. The will of God is for people always to be healed and always to hear the gospel. And so that's not going to end until this world comes to an end. Amen. But you see how simple it was. I just, I give you authority. Now go heal the sick. Just go run along, <laughs> run along, get busy, start healing. And, and they did. Amen. Super simple. And then in Mark chapter three, then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power. Again, that's exousia authority that they might have authority to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. Okay, so the, the mention here is it's authority. So authority, when you exercise your authority, when you issue commands, when you command a devil, it releases the power of God. When you command a sickness, you release the power of God. When you co command any situation in life, your commanding, your operations and authority cause the power of God to flow to address the situation that you've spoken to. Amen? So authority is the principal thing. Okay, Mark chapter 6, verse 7 and 13. And Jesus called the 12 disciples to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power. Again, that's exousia authority. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. So they went out and preached that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So here you can see they're casting out demons, they're healing people with sicknesses, and it says, and they heal them, and the implication, they heal them all, right? And again, we only have that one example of the disciples' failure to heal someone, which was the little epileptic boy. And then again, in Luke chapter 10, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Okay, so Jesus is constantly doing the same thing. So first he was operating in authority and in the Holy Spirit and power and he was healing the sick. Then he appointed the 12 disciples and he gave them authority. He delegated authority to them and they went out and they were preaching and healing. And then he appointed 70 additional disciples because there's a lot of work to be done in this earth. So he appointed 70 more and they went out healing the sick because he had delegated to them authority. Okay, and then, you know, after his resurrection, you have Mark 16 and then all believers are commissioned to go out and preach the gospel, cast out demons and heal the sick. So that is an everlasting assignment that all disciples of Jesus have past, present and future. Amen. And so just as it was easy for them just to recognize Jesus gave me authority, now I need to go preach and I need to go heal. Um, it should be easy for us as well. Amen? So authority is the principal thing. All right, so then number eight, 
Remember that you are better equipped than the disciples who walked with Jesus before his resurrection. They were not born again. They were not baptized with the with a permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit like we have. All they had was delegated authority. You know, we have something far greater than that. We're literally sons of God. They, they were not sons of God. They did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They did not have the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God within them. We, we do have the rule and reign of God. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We are the temple of God. We, are, we have the Spirit of God in us. We have the Spirit of God upon us. We have received the authority of Jesus Christ, all authority in heaven and on earth. We have been seated on high in Christ, far above all principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and every name that is named. So there's like, there's at least six different angles to how we have authority. So let me just show that real quick. So if you think about what the disciples had, they had, you can say they had number one and number two. You know, the name of Jesus is the name above all names. That name has authority in it. So you can just believe in the name of Jesus and exercise that name and you can operate in authority. Okay, then they also, they explicitly, Jesus gave them delegated authority. And we can see that in these passages. He gave them exousia. He gave them authority. He gave them authority. You know, in all these passages we just read, he was giving authority. So that's a delegated authority. It was a temporary thing, right? It's delegated. Like I could be, you know, I could be, you know, or what's the word I'm looking for? I could be appointed to be a police officer. So as long as I'm a police officer, I have a badge, I have authority, I have a gun, right? I'm, I have authority, but that position could be temporary. I could resign from the position or the position expires and then I've lost that authority. Okay, that's a delegated authority. You, you can give it and you can take it away. Okay, so it was temporary. Okay, well, we have, um, we have more aspects. So we have authority in the name. You know, we have Jesus has always given, you know, delegated authority. We have that. There's commissional authority. Like we're given a commission in, in Mark chapter 16. He says, go preach, cast out demons, lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So that commission, within a commission from God, there's the authority and the ability to, to carry that out. We also have positional authority. You know, we are now, we are in Christ, and we are seated in heavenly places far above all things. And so we are far above. Whatever you are above will obey your command. You just have to know that you're the one in charge. You're the one with authority. And if you release your authority, if you issue your commands, you exercise that authority, then whatever's beneath you must obey your commands. Amen? Okay, then we also are heirs of God. And you know, so we have an inheritance. We have inherited the authority of Jesus Christ. And you know, the Holy Spirit, um, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will declare to us all things that belong to him. Well, when Jesus was raised from the dead, one of the things that was given to him was all authority in heaven and all authority on earth. Well, guess what? We are joined together with Christ. Jesus is really, he's just the head of Christ and me and you and all the other believers, we are the body of Christ. So the entire Christ is partaking in the authority that Jesus um, accomplished when he was raised from the dead. All authority in heaven and all authority on earth. Okay, to say it a different way, you know, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within us when we're born again. Okay, so we have this inheritance that uh, is another angle on authority. Okay, and then lastly, you know, Jesus died and made us kings and priests to Father God. So a king is somebody who, whatever a king commands, it will be done, or heads are going to roll, like in the in the old school, you know, physical kingdoms. Okay, for us, you know, Jesus is the king of kings. We are the kings that are underneath Jesus, and kings have supreme authority. Whatever a king commands, it shall be done. Okay, so, you know, there, there might even be some more angles on authority that I haven't thought of yet, but probably my next teaching is just going to be this all-encompassing authority, and we can talk about all these different angles, and if you can just believe in one of them, then you're going to be effective, right? Because authority is the principal thing that we need to learn and understand and exercise to release the power of God. Okay, so we have all those different angles of how we've received authority. Also, we're born again. Also, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Also, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, so we are far better equipped to do the will of God than what the disciples were. They merely, they merely had delegated authority, whereas we have much more than that. 
And then we have Jesus making a statement like this in Luke chapter 7. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Okay, so from Jesus's perspective, you know, the greatest of all the Old Testament people, and just to be clear, the Old Testament was all the time up until when Jesus was resurrected. All of that would be Old Testament, Old Covenant, right? And it wasn't until Jesus was resurrected that we have the New Covenant in place. And so these disciples, when they were, you know, before Jesus' resurrection, when they were doing all this healing and devil casting and all these things, they were in the Old Covenant. They were not born again. And Jesus said, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, whom Jesus said was the greatest of them all. And he didn't even perform miracles. So if you can imagine when we're born again, we, we are in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is within us. And we are far greater than all of those people before the cross. Amen. We are after the cross. We have received the kingdom of God. We are far greater than all the people before the cross. We are much better equipped than all the people before the cross. And that that should enable us. It does enable us. You know, we just need to get our mind, our believing correct. That enables us to do all the works that Jesus did and greater works. Amen. Okay, now let's look at what God has done for us. So we have authority. We also are empowered to heal. So it's not just authority alone, but we have the Holy Spirit and miraculous power. And I, I want to start off with John 14, 12. And really, to me, this is the most powerful scripture in all the Bible. And so Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Okay, so Jesus said all the things that he was doing, all the works that he was doing, we will do the same things, and we will even do greater works. And so whenever you come to a passage like that, you know, don't read a study Bible because I'll try and talk you out of it. But the reality is Jesus explicitly meant exactly what he said. So when you, whenever you come to a passage like this, well, make a list. What were the works that Jesus was doing? Well, he was preaching and teaching with boldness and authority, and he was producing great faith in the people. That means I shall preach and teach with boldness and authority and produce great faith in the people. While he was casting out demons, I cast out demons. He was healing the sick, therefore I heal the sick. He was raising the dead, therefore I raise the dead. You know, so you make a list of all the works that he was doing, and he said we shall do the same exact things. Amen? He even said we would do greater things than what he was doing. And, you know, there's at least a couple of greater things. You know, one is in Jesus's earthly ministry, salvation was not possible because he had not yet gone to, you know, he had not yet uh, gone to the cross and been resurrected. Okay, so when we minister salvation to people, that's something greater than what Jesus was able to do in his earthly ministry. That's a greater work. Okay, in Jesus's um, time before the cross, the permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit was not available. Okay, well, whereas after the cross, it is available. Okay, so that's a greater work. And then maybe you can imagine a couple of other things, maybe some works in mass or whatever. But let's just catch up and do the same works he was doing, right? Let's let's get, you know, let's be effective in healing and casting out demons. Let's be effective in, you know, raising the dead, things like this. Amen? Okay, so how are we equipped to do these things? Well, first of all, you know, there's a million more passages, but we've been given authority just like any disciple at any day and age, you know, God gives them authority. So Luke 10, 19 is an example. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay, this is an everlasting statement that applies to any disciple of Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus, therefore we have authority to utterly destroy all evil things. We have authority to just to destroy all the power of Satan. Well, what's this power of Satan? He has power of sickness, power of demons, power of chaos, power of like all these different things that the devil does. Our authority that Jesus has given us 
is sufficient to destroy anything the devil is doing. Amen? The authority that Jesus has given us is over and above anything that the devil has. Like we have authority over the devil himself. Like literally, the devil is afraid of a believer who knows who they are in Christ, who knows the authority that God has given them, because we will utterly des destroy him. Amen? So that we, we must lay hold of the authority that we have. We must lay hold of, like, when we speak, you know, we're literally, we're speaking on behalf of Christ because we are literally the body of Christ. Amen? We are joined together with Christ. We are seated in heavenly places, joined together with Christ, the head, and the believers, the body. Amen? And so we can just get that concept in our, in our mind, and when we speak, when we issue a command, when we exercise authority, we are speaking from Christ against the devil, and we shall prevail. Amen? We have passages like James 4, 7. The Holy Spirit said, you know, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so this is a promise of God. If we resist the devil, then he will, that's a promise of God, flee from you. Okay, so we want to fulfill what the scripture's requirement is. We want to be submitted to God. So let's be born again. Let's align our lives to the will of God as best we can and continue to grow in that. And then there's at least three ways of resisting the devil, depending on what kind of situation you're facing. If you're dealing with the temptation, then you resist the temptation to do whatever the devil's trying to have you to do, something sinful, for example. Um, he may, the devil may be trying to get you to doubt. Maybe you're ministering healing to somebody and he brings a doubting thought to you, like, well, they're gonna die, I'm gonna look stupid, blah, blah, blah. He'll, he'll do that all day long, right? And so you'll get thoughts like that from the devil, and then you resist those thoughts by casting them down and rejecting them. Okay, then in terms of this teaching, you also resist the devil by way of authority, by commanding him and his sickness, his demons, his cancer, whatever. You command the devil and his works to get out of a person's body and soul in the name of Jesus, and it shall be done. He will flee from you. Amen? So our part in this is we have to believe. We have to believe that we have authority. We have to speak commands and expect them to be fulfilled without doubting and wavering. And when we do that, then we're going to be successful. And then, you know, there's a million other passages on, on authority. I'm not going to go into them, but maybe in the next teaching, I'll do an, a deep dive on authority. And then we'll look at all these multitude of, of different angles of from which we have authority. Okay? So the second thing is let's realize, how was Jesus able to do what he was doing? Okay, well, first of all, Jesus was in a position of authority over the devil and all of his works. You know, the reason, the reason mankind, like in the beginning, there was God, you know, God was above, then there was man, and then the earth was under the man, and then even the devil was below man, like in the very, very beginning. Okay, but when we sinned, when you sin, you know, we bowed the knee to the devil and so we were here and the devil was beneath us. After we sinned, the devil had legal authority over us because we had sin in us. So we bowed the knee to the devil. We made him the God of this world. And that's why he had authority over us. Well, Jesus, he never sinned. So the devil never had authority over Jesus, even though he was a man, even though he was in the earth. The devil had no authority over Jesus because he had no sin in him. Remember, Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming for me but he has nothing in me. Okay, so the, the, the nothing in Jesus was there was no sin in Jesus. Whereas all mankind that he came to save, we had sin in us and we needed to have our sin washed away to be rescued out from under the devil's kingdom and authority. Amen? Okay, so Jesus, he had authority over the devil. Secondly, you know, when Jesus was 30 years old, he was baptized in water and then at the same time, when he came out of the water, then he prayed, and then he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the Holy Spirit possesses the life-giving, supernatural, miraculous power of God. So anybody that's baptized with the Holy Spirit possesses the power of God by way of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus had authority, he had the Holy Spirit, and he had the miraculous power of God. And that's what equipped Jesus to do his ministry work. Amen? So let's just read that. So we can see it in Acts 10.38. You could see it also in Luke 4.18. 
So in Acts 10.30 it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. Okay, so we have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Spirit. So all three of the Godhead, they're all in agreement about this commission that Jesus had. And, and so Father anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. And along with the Holy Spirit comes the dunamis, miraculous power of God. It's the power to heal, the power to cast demons. It's the power to raise the dead. It's the power to do all the things that Jesus was doing. It's by way of the power of the Holy Spirit, this dunamis, miraculous, supernatural power. Okay, and so with this anointing, with the Holy Spirit, with this power anointing, Jesus went around and he was healing all. Jesus was healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with them. He had this permanent baptism of the Holy Spirit, so God was always with them forevermore, the, the Spirit um, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? So this is, this is what enabled Jesus to heal and to do all the things he was doing. Okay, well, interestingly, when we are born again and when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, then we are equipped in the exact same way that Jesus was. And that enables us to do the exact same works, healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. And the only thing standing in our way is we need to get our mind in agreement with these things. You know, we need to be believing and, and expecting so that we can do the same things Jesus was doing. We have the same equipping. Okay, so we can prove that in Acts 1a. And this is Jesus speaking. He said, but you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Okay, so we, Jesus said, okay, that when we receive the Holy Spirit, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Okay, there's some terminology that all means the same thing. If the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's the same thing as being anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's the same thing as being endued with the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing as being baptized with the Holy Spirit. All those terms mean the same thing. Amen? And so when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we also receive the dunamis, miraculous power of God because that power belongs to the Holy Spirit. And so if you have the Holy Spirit, you also have this dunamis, miraculous power. And so guess what? The same Holy Spirit that Jesus received, the same power that Jesus received, is the exact same Holy Spirit that we receive and the exact same power that we receive. Amen? So you can see that God has made us identical to Jesus in terms of authority, Holy Spirit, and power. Amen? We're identical. We're the same, the same creature that Jesus was walking around this earth. We're that exact same creature. Human, born again by the Spirit of God, anointed with the Holy Spirit, anointed with the power of God. And so then the only thing standing in our way is our imagination. We have to renew our mind. And as we renew our mind and fully come to believe in these things, then we're going to release more and more power and look more and more like Jesus in our walk in this life. Amen. And just to, to testify to that, you know, I just got back from this mission trip and, you know, we were teaching about healing, authority and, you know, other topics. And when it came time to pray in these two different locations that we went to, it wasn't just me praying for the sick. It was, you know, a team of us were praying. And so you'd have a, um, like Mick and Ange were praying for people. Maybe me and John and my translator were praying and Isaiah and his wife and others were praying. So we had multiple groups of people that were praying for the sick and we all had phenomenal results. Like at least in the things that you could like test, like pains and, you know, physical limitations, anything that was testable where we would know instantly whether or not something happened at least 90% instant healings, you know, and then the other ones, we have to believe that as they went, they were healed. I mean, so we were having phenomenal success. Why? Because we're disciples of Jesus. He's given us authority. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us miraculous power. And we have a commission. He commissioned us go out into all the world and preach, cast out demons and heal the sick. And so we were doing the commission that he gave us. And, and, you know, again, you know, if God commissions you to do something, he equips you to perform that commission. Mark 16 is for all believers. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, you know, and, and so forth. Like, 
cast out demons, heal the sick. So if he tells you to do something, then he also equips you to carry out that commission. And that, and what he's done in Acts 1.8, he has equipped us to do that commission. And so Jesus is telling us that we shall be witnesses to him. Okay, so a witness, if you think about in court, a witness is somebody who provides evidence of something. And so when we go out into all the world and we do the same works that Jesus was doing, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, when we do those miraculous works that Jesus was doing, um, and we're preaching the word of God, we're teaching the gospel, what are we doing? We're speaking the word of God, and then we are providing evidence. We are witnesses. We provide evidence that the gospel that we have spoken is true because healings are happening, dead raisings are happening, devil castings are happening, all these things are happening. And so we are we are witnesses to Jesus by way of the miraculous works that we perform in his name. Okay? A lot of Christians think of witnessing as like when you go door to door and then, you know, they talk to you about a scripture or two at your front door. Okay, well, that's that's a form of witnessing, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about something much more powerful than reading words. A reading words from a Bible doesn't prove anything. It's just words. Every religion has a Bible. Like, how do I know your Bible is true and not the one that the other guys, you know, they're using. How do I know which Bible from which religion is true? And you don't know unless there's a demonstration of power, right? How do I believe this book over that book over the other book? How do I know that Islam's not true? How do I know that Hinduism's not true or, or any other religion? The way you know is that we operate in the Holy Spirit. We operate in the power of God. We perform the works of Jesus, healing, dead raising, devil casting. And in doing those works, we become witnesses, providing evidence, first of all, that God loves them. Second of all, we deliver the help to their body and soul that they need. And third of all, it solidifies the words we speak as true because the power of God has been demonstrated. Amen? So the conclusion of this page is we are absolutely made identical to Jesus. Amen? As Jesus was walking around this earth, so are we. And we want to we want to believe in that. We want to exercise our God-given authority. And when we exercise our God-given authority, believing, then the power of God is released from the Holy Spirit, which we possess. Amen? So power doesn't have to, like, flow from heaven. Like, the Holy Spirit's in you. It can just flow directly from you to address the situation. Let me see how we're doing on time. Okay? All right, so let's go on. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is the way we minister. So we minister healing by commanding, by exercising authority in the name of Jesus. And there's other ways you can minister, but this is the principal way. So we just want to, you know, get this as our foundation. So the first thing we want to talk about is Mark 11, 22 to 24. I know we always talk about this. Maybe you're tired of it, but... This is how Jesus taught us to minister to situations. And a lot of people are wondering why they don't have a fruitful prayer life. And a lot of times the reason is because they're not praying the way Jesus told us to. They're not dealing with problems and situations, a.k.a. mountains, the way Jesus told them to. Okay, so let's read the instructions. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Okay, so this is this is Jesus's instructions for dealing with a problem, which he's just calling a mountain in this example. Okay, so we need to have faith in God. So we're we're all believers on this call, so we have faith in God. We should have a well-rounded faith. You know, in Jesus' day, they, you know, they knew, well, first of all, they were speaking Greek, so they knew that the word sozo didn't just mean your sins are forgiven, you get to go to heaven when you die, but sozo, because they were, they spoke Greek, they understood the definition of sozo was big. 
You could be sozo healed. You could be sozo devil casted. You could be sozo rescued, sozo saved, sozo delivered, you know, sozo provided for. So when when they heard the word sozo, like Jesus came to give them this sozo salvation, you know, they had a broad faith in God, believing that God would help them in this present life and also help them in future life to have eternal life. So they they had a broad understanding and faith in God, and we need to have that same broad understanding and faith in God. Okay, then. He says, surely I say to you, whoever. So it doesn't have to be a special person. Jesus is all about anyone who believes. And let's just go back here for a second. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes. I mean, that's that's the number one thing right there. Anyone who believes. You know, the, the gospel is not about pastors, preachers, teachers, evangelists. It's not about people with position. It's about people who believe. Amen. So anyone who believes can do all the miraculous works that Jesus was doing. It's just anyone who believes. So that's the key thing. So whoever, any believer, any believer who says to the problem, you know, Jesus did not say, talk to God about your problem. He didn't say, beg and plead with God. He didn't say, tell God how terrible the situation is. He didn't say to do any of that stuff. And he, he said to have faith in God. He didn't say to talk to him. He said to have faith in him. He tell Jesus is, is telling us, talk to the problem. Talk to the problem, not to God. Talk to the problem. Talk to it as if it's a person. Talk to it as if it's a criminal, an, an evil entity. And so you want to talk to your problem, and then you want to command it. Be removed. That's a command. Be cast. That's a command. Cancer, go. That's a command. Devil, I command you to go. That's a command. Pain, I command you to leave. That's a command. So all he's saying is anyone who has faith in God shall speak directly to their problem. They shall exercise authority by commanding, telling the problem what to do. You command the problem. And then if you do not doubt in your heart, but if instead of doubting, if you believe, then you will have whatever you say. Amen. And then he says, when you pr pray, believe. So we have to be believing when we pray. And then if there's any gap in time before the answer comes, we need to continue to believe and however long it takes for the, the answer to come forth. We need, to, we need to pray believing and continue to believe. And so that's where the devil likes to work. He tries to war against our believing. And he especially is happy if there's some amount of time between prayer and answer he likes that because he'll work hard on you to try and sway you out of faith. Okay, but we can talk about some tips and tricks next time that will help us believe and stay in faith. Okay, so this, this is how to deal with the situation. It's how to deal with cancer. It's how to deal with finances. It's how to deal with demons. Any situation we face in life, this is the approach that Jesus has given us and is extremely effective. You know, our responsibility is to be believing. And you know, remember the passage in, in John, I think it's chapter 6, the disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. Believe on him whom the Father has sent. So if we want to work the works of God, Jesus is saying we have to believe in him. And so that's the number one thing we have to work on is our believing and, you know, just Teaching, just simple teaching that's true and accurate combined with testimonies, that's all we need. You know, and then as we put our faith into practice, we get experiences, we get victories. We want to celebrate the victories. We want to continuously tell everybody about the victories. We want to avoid replaying the failures. We've, we've all had plenty of failures. Replaying all the failures, all it does is make you sad or it takes you out of faith or it causes doubt. We don't want to replay the failures. You know, we, as far as any past faith failure, maybe you can just ask God, you know, what can I learn from this? What can I do differently next time? But we have to move on from those and not get stuck back there. And I know all of us have had maybe been, we've had, we've had situations happen in our past, which maybe derailed us for a time. And, and then we just get back on the track, you know, like let's move beyond the failures and let's get going again. Amen. You know, I've been there, others of you have been there, and let's just keep keep pressing forward. Okay, so this is the way we're going to pray. 
And then, you know, here's our commission in Mark 16, 17 to 18. And these signs, miraculous signs and wonders, will follow those who believe. We have to believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will, promise of God, recover. Okay, so when we break down this passage, Jesus is, he's, you know, this is after he's resurrected, right? So he's already commissioned the 12 before the cross. He commissioned the 70 before the cross. Now he's commissioning everyone who believes in him after the cross. Every single believer he's giving this commission to. These miraculous signs will follow those who believe in him. Okay, if we believe in him, then we'll speak to the mountain and it shall be removed. If we believe in him, then we do all the works that he did. If we believe in him, we do the works of God. And so believing is the principal thing. Then you know, in his name, we will cast out demons. Okay, so in this commission, there's authority and power to cast out demons. Um, we will speak in tongues. That edifies us in faith. We will have immunity to deadly things like serpents and poison. They will by no means hurt us. And they will lay hands on the sick. Believers will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So always remember when we read the Bible and you find the word will or shall. Um, believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's a promise of God. Or we can go back here where he says, where he says, resist the devil and he will promise of God, flee from you. So the word will or shall indicates a promise. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen. So when we find these wills and shalls, we want to cling to them. Because if we can, if we can be believing, this is a guaranteed yes to your prayer. Because it's a promise. Amen. Every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen. And our challenge is, you know, it's easy to like pray and get instant healing. It's harder when you pray and you don't see anything with your eyes. That's the hard part, right? And sometimes that happens. And so that's what becomes a challenge for us. We need to resolutely stand firm. I have a promise of God. They shall recover. I'm not going to back off of it. The devil's resisting me. I need to resist him more. I need to be persistent. You know, so we need to pray for persistence as one of the key qualities that we need to have in addition to believing, we need persistence also so that we can endure and prevail whenever there's a stubborn situation. Because there's plenty of stubborn situations that we've already faced and that we'll face in the future. So we need that insistence and persistence. And we need to cling to every promise of God. This is a guarantee if we can, if we can stay in faith, they will recover. So keeping these things in mind, you know, here's... An approach to prayer, it's very simple and straightforward. It's based on these things we've talked about. You know, my conversation or our conversation with God should be more around, you know, thanking him for what he's done for us. So thank you, Father, for your goodwill. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you know, bore our sicknesses so that we can be free from sickness. Thank you, Jesus, that you carried our pains so that we can be free from pain. Thank you, Jesus, that you took stripes on your back and you paid for the healing of all mankind. Thank you, Jesus, that you bore the curse so that we are redeemed from curse. Thank you, Jesus. And so we want to acknowledge what Jesus has done. We want to acknowledge our Father's goodwill. That's, that's what our conversation with God should be about. Okay? And as far as dealing with the problem, we want to boldly and strongly command the devil and his sickness and pain to leave in the name of Jesus. Amen? Just be bold and be authoritative. You can yell and scream if you want to. You can be stern if you want to. You can get a mean voice if you want to. Um, whatever works for you, right? So you know if you're being authoritative or if you're being a wimp. And so wimpy prayers are not answered. You have to be authoritative. So you have to know and feel that you are being authoritative in the situation. And whether that's loud, whether that's stern, whether it's a mean voice or whatever, it's, it's, it's just do some experimentation and see what works for you. Amen? Okay, then the second thing you want to do as you're dealing with the problem is you want to boldly and strongly command whatever you need, such as healing, to come forth and to be done in the name of Jesus. 
Okay, so the step one is kick the problem out. Step two is to bring the answer in, okay? So if somebody has cancer, in the name of Jesus, I command you, Satan, and I command you, cancer, get out of this person's body right now and do not return. I command in the name of Jesus, you know, let's just say it was their liver. Liver, I command you in the name of Jesus, be healed, be cancer-free, function properly. So you just want to issue commands for whatever it is that the person needs. Amen? You command the problem to go. You command whatever they need to come forth and to be done. Just command, command, command. That's all we do. And then when you're finished with your commanding, just thank God once again for his promise answer to your prayer. And then you just have to rest in faith. And, and then that's where there could be some homework. So if it's instant, good for you. That's that's the best case scenario. We would like 100% instant. Um, chances are, though, we're going to have many things that are not instant. And then that's when we're going to have this challenge to, to stay in faith because the devil likes to work in that gap and try and bring doubts. Okay, and we'll talk about that next time. Okay, and then point number six here. You know, the, the best thing is if you can pray live with the person. Like if you're in person and you can lay hands on them, that's the best case scenario. If you can get on the phone and pray with them like live over the phone, that's maybe second best because then maybe if they have a breathing problem, you can ask them to try it out. Like, okay, we just prayed. I want you to take a deep breath. Or maybe you're praying for somebody over the phone. They had pain in the back. You can ask them to move their back around, bend over, or do something like that. So anytime you can pray live with the person, that's going to be the best case scenario because then you can iterate back and forth. You can pray multiple times in a row trying to work out that instant healing. So it's always better if you have that live connection. Okay, but if you can't pray live, then you know you can still you know pray, like record a message and send it to them. That's great because then they can replay it over and over. You can just pray for them all by yourself. You don't have to tell them. You know, your authority works no matter whether they hear it or don't hear it. Your authority works whether you're in person or on the other, other side of the world. You know, it, it works. In fact, the majority of the healings that happen in our ministry, almost everything is remote because we're we're all over the place. You know, we're all over the United States. We're all over the, the globe. Um, there's really not very many people here locally that I can go lay hands on. Usually it's some prayer request from some other corner of the earth. Okay. And so your authority works anywhere, but if you can pray live, that's going to be best. Okay. Then the other thing is, you know, it's really good to pray in agreement with somebody, especially if there's a dire situation, like somebody's on the brink of death. It's good to pray in agreement because you know, especially if it's somebody that you love, like if, if a relative, if your relative is sick to where they might die, um, chances are you may have some fear in your heart. And if you're in fear, you're not in faith because fear and faith, they're opposite. Fear is faith in the devil, whereas positive faith, it's faith in God expecting good outcomes. You are not, there's no such thing as simultaneously being in fear and simultaneously being in faith. They're opposites. Amen. So if you have you know, somebody that you really care about or that's like a, an active part of your life, especially then get somebody to pray in agreement with you because somebody outside of your family is more likely to be in faith and not in fear. And at least one person needs to have faith. Okay. So that's why this is important. But Jesus said, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. Okay. So you would just, if you're going to pray in agreement, you just take the same principles that we talked about. We know that we have authority. We're going to speak to the mountain. We're going to issue commands. We're going to command the devil and sickness to go. We're going to command the body to be healed. We're going to command them to be filled with strength or whatever they need. And so we're just going to pray in agreement in the same manner, um, whether alive and in person, whether by yourselves, it doesn't matter, right? But the prayer of agreement is extremely powerful. Okay, so we're going to stop there for today.